I'm sure you recognize these instruments as the shepherd's staff and the shepherd's rod. The staff was for guiding the sheep, rescuing the sheep, and generally leading the sheep. The rod was used to protect the sheep. These are authentic um, objects from the Middle East. Uh, about five years ago, I attended a seminar by a famous theologian, and he was teaching on uh, what it means to be a shepherd, and he said he bought several sets of these when he was in the Middle East, and so I went up afterwards and asked if I could buy them because they are on display near my desk. They remind me what I have been called to do. And as far as I understand, of all the images that God could use to capture his heart for the peoples of the earth and for his church, the shepherd is perhaps the most endearing of all the representations of God. Uh, as soon as I mention the shepherd, I know that many of you are already quoting the words in your heart. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I know you've heard this from me 5,000 times, but my famous quote of Psalm 23 was the five-year-old girl who was asked to quote Psalm 23, to which she said, the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. She had it the way God intended it, didn't she? Of course, you can't think about the shepherd without going in your mind to John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Thank God for the sacrifice of Christ's life as our good shepherd. I don't know about you, but when I look back over the experience of my life, the one consistency and the strong foundation of my life are the words of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, when he said, you were once like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Jesus isn't just your great shepherd. He's the one who leads you through every experience of life. He's the one who watches over your life. He's the shepherd and overseer, or the word can be bishop. He's your bishop, the overseer of your soul. And I'm being selfish now, but I especially like the word pastor. It is a biblical word. It is one of the gifts that God said he would give to the church for the building up of the church until we reach maturity in Christ. He said, one of the gifts I will give you is the shepherd teacher, the pastor teacher. So I particularly like the title or the gift of pastor in the New Testament. So thank God that he is our great shepherd. But as you might know, on the way to the cross... Jesus told his disciples that he would be struck down by the very rod that he used to protect us. He would be struck down at the cross and the sheep would be scattered everywhere. He would suffer the blows of the wrath of Almighty God against himself so that we didn't have to absorb them. He would receive the blows of evil men so that we could be delivered from the guilt of our sin. And it's detailed in Mark chapter 14. Would you grab your Bibles and join me there, please, as I talk to you today about striking the shepherd. Mark chapter 14, this is our second week on our journey to Easter. I'm beginning in verse number 12 and going all the way down through verse number 35 and as always, I want to tell you with great joy that the reading of God's Word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it because the Bible is the inspired and inerrant, all authoritative Word of the Lord. It is our foundation. It is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We don't take the word of churches and traditions and rituals. We take the word of God as our guide. Verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed, that was a bloody sacrifice, a lot of blood flowed on that day, a great deal of blood, rivers of blood, literally, the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat Passover? 
And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and you'll see a man carrying a jar of water and he will meet you. What is really odd about that is that men never carried jars of water. It was always a woman's job. So this man would stand out. The disciples would see him immediately. Jesus said, when you see that man, follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there prepare for us. And his disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he told them, as you will always find. Everything just as Jesus says it will be. And I love this. They prepared the Passover. And when when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said to them, this is the second time he's going to point this out in this same chapter. Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and say to one another, is it I? The account of this same conversation recorded in John's gospel says that Peter was sitting next to John who was sitting next to Jesus and Peter leaned over to John and said, ask him, who is it? Which one is it? Who will be the one who will betray us? And so Jesus gave them a sign. He said, I'm going to take a piece of bread and dip it in hummus perhaps, or uh, olive oil probably, and the one to whom I give that bread is the one Jesus served the piece of bread to Judas. And the Bible says at that moment when Jesus served the bread, Satan entered Judas. They're asking, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread in the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. Notice Jesus' confidence in Scripture. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better if that man had never been born. As they were eating, he took bread after blessing it. He broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, obviously on the way to the Mount of Olives, to Gethsemane, you're all going to fall away. You will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now notice Jesus' confidence. But after I'm raised up, I'll see you in Galilee. I'll meet you. I'll go before you into Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all shall fall away, I will not. I will not. I will not. You're way overconfident if you think there is anything beyond your capability of doing, even in denial of Jesus. I will not, Peter says. I will not. Jesus said to him, I'm telling you, Peter, before this night is over, the rooster will crow twice and you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die, I'll die first, Lord. I'll die. See the argument he's having with Jesus? (laughs) Why wouldn't Peter just come to his senses and have learned from now when Jesus says something, humble yourself because it's on its way. I will die before I deny you. But it's sad that Peter is the one who is mostly remembered because the text says, and they all said the same thing. That would have been true of you and me if we were there. Let me show you how this passage demonstrates how Jesus was struck down. Number one, verses 12 through 16, the shepherd is struck down as the Passover lamb. When you come to verse number 12, you're introduced immediately to an ancient practice that was very familiar to the Jews. And by now, to most Christians, we understand the religious significance of the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb really was God's ancient way of ultimately preparing the whole world for the sacrifice of his son, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. This text tells us that God has been preparing for this 
enormous day when his son would die as the substitute for our sins. But in fact, I'm quite convinced the Passover lamb is predated by another sacrifice that God had to make in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve were naked and ashamed before the Lord, and he slew an animal and covered them with the animal's skin. So God was establishing that his means of dealing with our sin is the sacrifice and the shedding of blood. And only in the shedding of blood can there be the forgiveness of sins. So, so when we come to Mark chapter 14, we're really seeing Jesus saying, this, is the, this has been the full dress rehearsal for the greatest act in the history of the world, the cross. He'd been preparing the Jews especially. They would have understood the commandments and traditions like the back of their hand. Every family gathered in Jerusalem at Passover. Josephus seems to indicate that there were upwards of two to three million people at that time when the lamb was sacrificed. Every family, every clan had to bring a sacrificial lamb, one without blemish. They would give it to the priest and the throat would be slit and the blood would be caught in, in basins. And the blood would be ushered down two lines of priests until it finally came to the altar where the priest would sprinkle the sin against the altar. The lamb was given back to the people after it was appropriately dressed because the entrails and the fat were part of the sacrifice. But then each family was given the lamb back to take home to roast and only roast. They could not boil it. They could not contaminate the lamb as it was roasting in a giant pot. And at the right moment, they would begin to tear the flesh away from the lamb and enjoy it along with numerous other ingredients for what made the Passover lamb. That vast history of the Passover feast culminated in the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when he said, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And Hebrews says, Once and for all, there is no need for any more sacrifice. There is no need for any more blood. The old has gone, the new has come, and the new is Christ, who took our place at the cross. So can you see how Jesus has been preparing the whole world for this moment? And as he sat consuming the Passover meal, he knew full well what every bit of that tradition reflected in his own life. But the, there's another side to this same event, and that is the disciples prepared Passover for Jesus. By simply, the whole thing simply began with a question. How long since you've asked God any good question? Good questions. God delights to hear your heart postured as a question to him. What do you want me to do, Lord? Where do you want me to go, Lord? Is this the job you have for me, Lord? Is this the person I should marry, Lord? What is your will for my life? The disciples at least had the gumption to come to God, to Jesus, and say, what exactly do you want us to do to get ready for the Passover? I love it. Because some of you are so passive, you're afraid to ask God the hard questions. He's just waiting to hear from you. What is it, Lord, that keeps me discouraged? What is it, Lord, that lies beneath the surface that causes such anxiety in my heart. God loves to hear those questions. He's a question receiving and a question answering God. So the disciples came to Jesus and said, what do you want us to do? He said, I've taken care of it already. I, I've already arranged the details, which is the way it always is as a Christian. We come to God and seek his will. We posture our heart in humility, obedience, and say to God, what do you want? And then we find out he's already been doing the whole thing for us. It just falls into place. Why? Because he prearranges the details. He doesn't leave anything to chance. 
He makes sure that all of the details are in perfect alignment for what he wants to do in your life. I'm saying this humbly because I think it needs to be humbly said. I don't understand the vast sovereignty of God. I believe it. I know it's taught in the Bible. But there are lots of mysteries, like the mystery of evil we're going to encounter in this passage. What I know is that for from him, Jesus, and through him, Jesus, and to him, Jesus, are all things to whom be the glory forever and ever, Romans says. But you, you need to notice that having asked Jesus what he wanted, they did it. That's just a simple spiritual lesson. You will never move to B until you do A. God will not speak more in your life. God will not give you more light and not give you more grace until you do what he asked you to do. And it says of the disciples in verse number 16, they went and prepared the Passover just as he said. God's waiting to teach us the same simple lesson that we spend 18 years trying to instill in our children. Learn to be obedient to your mom and dad because you are, you are going to learn in your adult life to be obedient to God. So here's the Passover. Here's Jesus being struck down as the Passover lamb. Number two, I want you to see in verses 17 to 21, the shepherd is struck down to overcome evil. This is the second time we're encountering evil sitting at the communion table or at the Passover meal, as it were. And what's interesting in this passage is that Jesus preempts evil. He doesn't wait for Judas to speak up. He calls Judas out. Why? Because Jesus doesn't wait for the gates of hell to advance against him. He commands us to advance against the gates of hell. The church doesn't cower in fear. We don't hide from the darkness of the world. He's commanded us to go into the world as salt and light. You know what that means, church family? We all need to be involved in a bunch of broken people's lives. God didn't call you to comfort and safety. He called you to pierce the darkness. He called you to go into the ugly, messed up, ruined places of the world with his grace and his love and extend the message of Christ, the sacrificial lamb who died for the sins of the world. Don't shy away from the hard people and hard places of your life. Step up. Step up. Because Christ does. Christ always does. And he explains to the disciples why he did this. In John 13, the, probably the most expansive explanation of Judas's place at the table, he says, I'm going to do this for three reasons. The first is to fulfill scripture. He says that in Mark chapter 14. This is all happening according to Psalm 41.9. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. There is no wound like a friend who eats at your table betraying you. And yet Christ looked back to Psalm 41 and said, This is all going down the way the Father said it would in Scripture. So may I give you a warning? Trust the Bible. Don't doubt the Bible. If you begin doubting the Bible, the enemy has struck an enormous victory in your mind. Tune out those pastors and theologians, even among evangelicals, who are telling you you can't trust the Bible because it's full of errors or copious mistakes, etc., etc., etc. David said, the, the testimony of the Lord is sure. God's word is perfect. Every word is perfect. Trust it. I'm not sure what pastors are up to encouraging people to question the Bible. My posture simply is, I take the Bible the way Jesus took the Bible. I trust what it says. I believe it is living and active. It's like the rain that falls down from heaven, Isaiah said. When it waters the earth, it will produce the fruit God intended. We don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus. He is the Word of God, the Son of God. But for me, I don't make a distinction 
in Jesus being Lord, and I need his word to understand his mind and his heart. Jesus said, all this is going down so that the scriptures could be fulfilled, and it's going down perfectly as the scriptures say, so that you will know, he says again in John 13, I am who I am. Does that sound familiar? I am. I am who I am. I am Almighty God. And you'll know it because when you look back, you will see that every detail of my suffering and passion and crucifixion and resurrection is only possible if you have divine knowledge. And Jesus demonstrated that. He also works the story of Judas into this event so carefully to protect his disciples. He doesn't want them to feel like they're in grave danger. There's a big difference, you see, between growing weak and tired and being tempted than having a heart where Satan could enter. I don't suspect there's a person in this room or 50 miles from this room who professes to be a Christian that would make room like that for the devil in their hearts. They would flee it instantly. So be careful. Jesus is protecting his children here, and he is saying, he said it in John 13, I'm not referring to all of you. I'm just referring to the bad apple. <laughs> I'm just referring to the bad apple. He's, he's rotten to the core. And so be very careful about assigning judgment to the wrong person. And be very careful about assigning the right judgment in the wrong way to the right person. Don't assign evil to God's children. Challenge them when you have to, but be careful about that. So Jesus preempts and pierces the darkness. He advances against the darkness. And the text tells us he was troubled in his spirit, um, agitated, worked up, concerned. The disciples saw that. On the face of Jesus, something was really bothering him. And what was bothering him is that there was a betrayer at his table. I think the greatest lesson that you can learn from Jesus in his confrontation of Judas is how he overcame the evil. You want to know how to come, overcome evil? The way Jesus did in the text. And he overcame evil by offering bread to the hungry a drink to the thirsty, and kindness to the worst among him. I know theologians argue about this, and I haven't figured it out. I'm, frankly, I'm not worried about it. I'll let the Lord figure it out when I get to heaven. But it seems to me like Jesus was saying to Judas, there's one last chance. The door is closing, but there's a chance for you to turn from the wickedness you're about to commit. He very kindly invited Judas to sit at the meal and at the feast. And he, he personally served Judas a piece of bread. He did exactly what he told Paul to write in Romans 12. I wonder if this was what Paul was thinking about when he said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the true and godly character of the church. I had a very satisfying phone call recently with our honorable minister of parliament, during which I said to him, Omar, my friend, the highest and best form of leadership is demonstrated in how you treat those you don't agree with, your enemies. Jesus modeled this. For us. Today we cancel each other, we shout at each other, we scream at each other, we impugn each other's character, and yet Jesus, here's Jesus with Judas, lavishing this kindness upon him. Now don't get me wrong, before the passage is over, Jesus does judge evil. He is the judge who will bring all evil into account. 
In the end, he said to Judas, Woe to you, Judas! It would be better for you if you had never been born than for you to do what you're about to do. In fact, he said, you better go do it quickly. And the Bible says Satan entered him. As far as I know, brother, that's the only place in the Bible where we're told that Satan entered a human being. I could be corrected. Don't bother sending me the emails. I'll figure it out. (laughs) But it's a startling description. Dipping the piece of bread, Jesus gave it to Judas, and as soon as Jesus, Judas took the bread, Satan entered him, John 13 says. Now, this is very sobering to me. Judas was given over to Satan for judgment by Jesus. You're toast when that happens. And it's a picture of the end of the age. Jesus said, don't be surprised, the day is coming when all who are in the grave will hear my voice. And they will live. Those who have done good, they'll rise to the resurrection of eternal life. And those who have done evil, to damnation. The best good you can ever do is trust Jesus. The worst evil act anyone could ever perform is reject Jesus. And if you reject him, there will be a time when you will be turned over for eternal judgment. What about Christians? Do you know twice in the New Testament the Bible says that Christians can be handed over to Satan? Not for judgment, but for discipline. Paul instructed the church in Corinth to do it to those who were sexually immoral and boasting about it in the church. He instructed the church to act in solidarity and give this person, immoral person, over to Satan that they would be disciplined in their flesh so that they might come to their senses. And then Paul invoked the same action against two opponents of the gospel in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. So we see the great shepherd of the sheep struck down as the sacrificial lamb. He was struck down to ultimately overcome evil because Jesus stripped the enemy by his death. Let me show you thirdly. The shepherd is struck down to ratify the new covenant. It's the heart of this text when Jesus institutes the Lord's table, when he introduces a new way and a new covenant for his people to celebrate as long as we, the church, remains on the earth. He's basically saying the new covenant brings new access to God. There's no need now for priests and for sacrifices and rituals Jesus, you, you can sit personally in the presence of Jesus and unload your heart as a friend unloads his heart with a friend. Notice the picture here. They were sitting together eating as friends. That's the image God wants you to see in the church. We are all believer priests. You have direct and immediate access to the presence of God and you don't need somebody else to arbitrate on your behalf other than the Son of God who's doing it already. And so there's an intimacy with this new covenant. He's sitting with his disciples eating the Passover meal. And while he's eating the Passover meal, he adopts and transforms and sanctifies two simple elements that will demonstrate in their eating that I belong to him, I'm obedient to him, and I'm pursuing him in my life. And they are the bread and the cup, the bread and the wine, his his body, gifted as a sacrifice for us, and the the wine which represents his shed blood. Our defense and appeal as Christians is always, my strength and defense is the cross, where his body was nailed to a tree and where his blood was shed for the forgiveness of my sin. But there's more to it, isn't there? The Lord Institute, in this intimate setting, he chooses two of the elements, and he says, now I want you to understand why I've done this. Do you understand why you, as a Christian, you participate in the Lord's table? Paul especially outlines it in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's what he says. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Concerning what? Treating the great sacrifice of his body and blood irreverently, disrespectfully. 
He says, let a person examine himself, then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body of Christ eats and drinks judgment on himself. So why do we do it? The Lord's table is to protect you from drifting from Jesus, from carrying the burden of every day of your broken fellowship. The Lord's table is meant to protect you and to keep you honoring the body and blood of Christ. It's, it's a form of praying the Lord's prayer. Hallowed be your name. When we come to the Lord's table, we examine ourselves. Over the years, I've known people who have judged themselves unworthy of taking the Lord's table because they have some persistent sin in their lives, to which I've always said, you have no right and no authority, even as an individual Christian, to cease from participating in the Lord's table. The further you drift from the Lord's table, the further you drift from the heart of God. It's very, very important that you do what? The text tells us. Examine your heart. If there is a habit and persisting sin, say to the Lord, forgive me, Lord, and help me to grow. And then he says, then come and eat. Come and eat. The Lord's table is not for the perfect. It's for all of us. We come to protect ourselves, to feed our own faith. We do it to proclaim the death of the Lord. Every time we take the Lord's table, we're proclaiming that the Son of God took our place at the cross, and he died for us. But there's a third reason, and I like this, I like the other two as well, but it is, it is a prophetic look into the future. Jesus said in verse number 25, I'm going to celebrate with you now, but I won't drink it until we're together new in the kingdom of God. You know what he's saying? I can't wait to meet you at the marriage feast of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19. I can't wait, wait till we can sit together and eat this feast face to face again. How cool is that going to be that day when we will eat it with him new in the kingdom of God? You track it with me, church family? Whoa, that was... <laughs> yikes! This must be the time change weekend. I'm working my butt off up here, church family. Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. Our great shepherd. <laughs> what do you think? You think I missed that totally? Brother, I'm not coming after you. <laughs> I was about to say, our great shepherd was struck by the judgment of God, and he absorbed those blows as our Passover lamb to dismantle and destroy evil. And what was my third point? To ratify the new covenant. Let me show you the last thing in the text. The last, inter, uh, the last exchange between Peter and the disciples as they're making their way to the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane. The shepherd is struck down to magnify God's grace. If ever there was a place in the Bible where God's grace is magnified, it's right here. As they get up to leave the Lord's table or the Passover feast... Listen to me carefully, church family. Jesus sang a hymn with the disciples. It always strikes my heart when I look around and see people not singing the songs of worship with Jesus. They excuse themselves and say, I just can't sing. I can't either, I promise you. You don't want me singing a solo. But I sing all the time. Often it's the last thing I do at night. I put on a few songs to, to prepare my heart for a night's rest. I sing in the shower. I sing in the basement. I sing in the car. I sing in my office. And I see myself as singing in my heart and making melody with the Lord. Because he sang with the disciples on his way. Why do you think he did that? Because they are about to encounter evil and pressure in a way that they had not yet, and that music would be part of his healing in their soul and get them to the next stage. He's called the church to be a singing people. He has put a new song in our mouth, even praise to our God. Many will see it in fear. The mass notwithstanding, you cannot silence the new song in the heart of a believer. 
And as we sing, we should picture Jesus. By the way, it's not, I don't think it's anything strategic that it was hymns. It, probably, it, was an old, it was a psalm from the Old Testament. Paul takes that idea and expands it, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. The truth is that we must always keep writing the story of the gospel in fresh new music and worship songs. But notice in the text that Jesus clearly said to the disciples, I always see the before and after. He says, after this is over, I'm going to go before you in Galilee and I'll see you there, guys. I'll meet you on the other side. Why? Because Jesus can always see the before and after. He knows who you were before Christ. He sees you now, and you are forever sealed in the image that he, he knows you perfectly. He saw you before, and he sees you after, and his confidence to us is, just make your way to Galilee. I'll, I just love that, how easy it was for Jesus. This is all going to blow over. It's going to be a dark hour, but God's people always get through the dark hours and meet Jesus on the other side. And while he's on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, which we'll study next week, he speaks a word of truth in love to Peter and all the disciples. Peter is, like all of us, overestimating his faith in God and underestimating his potential to fail. It's called pride and humility. When we can't conceive that we didn't hear correctly. Peter didn't even hear from God. He thought he did. He portrayed himself as very heroic. Notice the savior complex in his mind. Everybody else will do it, but I won't. I'll, I'll, go, I'll die for you first. Good land, the Lord's already told him. Peter, humble yourself, man. A dark wave an evil force is going to hit you right in the face. And it will knock the wind out of you. And you will lose your spiritual equilibrium. But I will be there to restore you and pick you up. Jesus, it's a warning for us, Pastor Doug. It's a warning for us. We never reach the point of being beyond the ability to fail. If anything, we are prone to wander every day. None of you are so spiritually mature and perfect that you couldn't walk out these doors and deny Jesus. Not one of you. So what does it mean? We humble ourselves. Peter had to be knocked on his back. And like Joseph, when you're knocked on, the, on your back and you're in a pit... There's only one direction you can look, and that is to look up and say, my great shepherd, I need your rod and your staff to comfort me. My life is yours. Lead me in a plain path. Lord Jesus, we struggle to find the right words to bless you for accepting the blows that you did as you walk to the cross and when you were upon the cross. We bless you and thank you that you are the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and that your sacrifice, your body and blood are sufficient to cover our sin, to wash it away, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to take up residence in our lives as the great shepherd and the overseer that you are. So with joy in this moment, we present ourselves to you and say, lead us, Lord, but help us to be sensibly humble, completely dependent, and obedient to you, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.